This will be the first in a series of messages on demonology. And by way of introduction to my message, I would like to read to you a verse from the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 14. It is possible that when I first read this verse, you will not exactly understand how it applies to the topic demonology, but I'll read the verse and then I'll seek to explain how I relate it to demonology. The verse reads as follows. They have healed also the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. This is God's charge against the religious leaders and priests of his day, that they claim to have offered healing to his people, but it was not a genuine healing. Uh, the King James Version says, they've healed the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly. And this is explained by saying they say peace, peace, but there is no peace. In other words, they had a religious front, they had the religious language, they had the services of the temple, but they didn't have the real inner experience which God desired them to have. They didn't have that deep settled peace which comes from true faith in God and obedience to his word. And over the years, it has been borne in upon me that this is true of multitudes of professing Christians. They don't have what they profess to have. They're not specifically insincere, but they've been brought up to sing hymns about peace and joy. Their church or the denomination teaches them that Christians have peace and joy. Some of them are even trained to go out and witness to others that they have peace and joy, but really, their, their hurts have only been healed slightly. There's a cover-up for something that has never been dealt with deep down inside. To give you just a little illustration of this, I was in Auckland, New Zealand a couple of years back with, with a Baptist family, and the lady in the family was a teacher in a Sunday school, a sort of young adult Sunday school class, and they had a trained nurse in the Sunday school class who was not a believer but was there because she was interested and uh, really seeking. And they were talking about what the gospel does and how it gives people peace and joy and victory. And she stood up one day and she said something like this. Well, she said, when I don't have to visit the homes of the members of your church and administer sedation and tranquilizers on a large scale, she said, I'll believe in the peace and joy that you tell me that you have. But when your people are living on tranquilizers and sedation, there can't be all that peace and joy that you're talking about. And uh, I think this is a very real, let's say, criticism. Christians have been trained to believe that they have something. They speak as if they have something. They try to look as if they have something. They even feel guilty if they don't really have it. They still have to put on the front because that's the way people act in church. And if they claim to be Christians, that's how they're supposed to behave. But somehow, deep inside, there isn't that inner reality that corresponds to what they say they have. Now, I served as a medical orderly in the British forces in the Second World War, and I wasn't too much of an orderly, but I learned a few lessons which have remained with me very vividly. And one was an incident in the North African desert when a British soldier was brought into the reception station with a shrapnel wound in one shoulder, which had come when a bomb had exploded somewhere near him. And uh, he took off his shirt and his upper garments, and he was naked to the waist. And there on his shoulder was just a little sort of black puncture with a little blackness around the edge of the hole. And I, being uh, theoretically a nursing orderly, went up to the uh, doctor, the medical officer, and said, shall I get a first field dressing, sir? And he said, no, it's no good doing that. He said, bring me the probe. The probe in those days, I dare say medicine's changed a bit, was a silver stick that he would stick in. So he sat the man down on the chair and he stuck the probe in and he wiggled it around gingerly for a little while and suddenly the man went up in the air. And then the doctor said, now fetch me the forceps. So I fetched him the forceps and he put in the forceps where the probe had touched something in there, pulled it out, cleaned the wound up, now said, you can bring me the dressing. Then he said to me afterwards, you see the piece of shrapnel that caused the puncture was still in there. And if you just covered that up with a dressing without removing the shrapnel, it would go on suppurating and cause more complications. And uh, I always remembered that because I saw how foolish I'd been. But many, many times since then, in counseling and dealing with people, that incident has come back to my mind. And I've thought how many times 
a minister of the gospel, puts a first field dressing on, covers it up, but hasn't removed the thing that really causes the problem. And so, as you see in your outline, I've stated there, before we put the dressing on, we've got to use the probe and the forceps. We've got to find out what it is inside there that's really causing the trouble, producing the uncleanness, the irritation, uh, whatever it may be, the pain. We've got to remove it, even though the person may find it acutely painful just the moment we touch the little thing that's the source of the problem. And I have seen that this is true in the spiritual ministry. A great deal of what is called preaching and counseling is putting on a dressing on a wound that hasn't had the object that causes the problem taken out. And that the Lord has shown me over the recent years that the real problem-causing agent in spiritual needs and difficulties is an evil spirit. And we need the probe of discernment and we need the forceps of deliverance before we can cover that thing up and say it is really healed. And I must testify from experience that over the years I've seen so much of this covering a thing up that hasn't really been cleansed and brought to the light and dealt with that I'm sick of it. And I can well understand God's charge against the religious leaders of his day. They've healed the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, peace, peace, putting on the dressing, but there isn't any peace. And I would say to you this evening that in most Christian congregations you find very little real peace. You find very few people that have a deep, settled inner tranquility. You find very little real, spontaneous, overflowing joy. You find a lot of people trying to look good, trying to look happy. You find not a few preachers and song leaders that try to make people feel happy. And I don't know how it may be with you, but nothing makes me feel more unhappy than somebody trying to make me feel happy when I'm not happy. And I call that just covering the wound up and healing the hurt slightly. And I am convinced that God has come to a period in his dealings with his people when he is not going to tolerate that kind of thing any longer. The real root cause of most deep-seated and long-standing spiritual and personal problems is found in evil spirits, demons. In a later study, I'm going to try to give a little account of the nature and activity of demons or evil spirits. Let me just say for the present that I'm using the two phrases interchangeably, demon or evil spirit. I also notice the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians 9, 26, speaking about his own ministry. He says, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. You see, a wild or inexperienced boxer will lash out with his fists, but all he hits is air. He expends a lot of energy. He may even get the impression he's achieving a lot, but he really does his opponent no harm at all. And again, so much of Christian ministry and activity is really beating the air. It's, lo it's lashing out with words and sermons and prayers but if you don't know the real nature and whereabouts and activity of your enemy, it's a happy coincidence when you land a blow on him. And again, the real source of deep-seated, long-standing personal problems in most cases is demons or evil spirits. And until we come to detect them and realize and acknowledge their presence, know how they operate, and know the means to deal with them, we are mainly operating like someone that is beating the air. Now I'm going to take a little time to speak from personal experience. The Lord saved me very graciously and wonderfully in the year 1941 in an army barrack room of the British Army in the middle of the night. Less than two weeks later, he baptized me in the Holy Spirit in the same army barrack room. And right at that time, although I didn't have the religious language to use, to express it, he called me to his service. I knew from then onwards that my life belonged to God, that he had a plan for me and that he would work it out.
and he immediately began to show me certain parts of his plan for my future in one or other of various different ways which I don't want to go into. In 1946, I was released from the British Army in what was then Palestine and immediately became what is called a full-time minister, a missionary to the Jewish people in Israel. Later on, I became a pastor. Later on, I became a missionary to Africa. But from 1946 until the present day, I have been in what is called full-time Christian ministry. I've been associated with full gospel or Pentecostal groups from about five different countries, Sweden, Denmark, Britain, Canada, and the United States. And I've preached in four or five continents. So I am not without experience. And right from the day that I knew about salvation, the baps and the Holy Spirit, divine healing, I testified and preached of these things. I preached the full gospel, if you want to use that phrase. I knew about the new birth. I knew about the baps and the Holy Spirit. I knew about healing of the sick. I lay for one year and end in a military hospital later in the war and only got out when I found that divine healing worked and that I could trust God for the healing of my body as I trusted him for the salvation of my soul. I also believe that the signs in the world indicated that the second coming of Christ was near at hand and I testified and preached to that effect also. And I really believe that I was preaching the full gospel. I was preaching all that I knew to preach and I saw results. I saw people saved regularly. I saw many people healed. I saw many receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I completed with my wife five years of missionary service in East Africa where people would have rated us as successful missionaries. We had the approval of our mission. We had the approval of the British government, the education department with whom we were associated. I still have letters of testimonial from them today. But when we came back to Europe at the end of 1961, and we were in my wife's native country, which is Denmark, for a little while I was not actively preaching, and the Lord began to deal with me. Now, I'm not going to seek to explain to you tonight exactly how he de dealt with me or exactly how God speaks. I know there are different ways that God speaks to different people. But let me say that the Lord very clearly spoke to me but not with an audible voice. And in essence, what he said was this, and I'm summarizing. Now, you have preached for so many years. You've been a missionary in two countries. You've been a pastor. You're the principal of a college. You're the member of a denomination. You have a pension scheme. He went down the whole thing in a very practical way. And then he came out with this question. Are you satisfied or do you want to go further? And that question really upset me. And you know, my first reaction, I'm ashamed to say it, was, well, is there anything further? I've preached the full gospel. What more is there to preach? Now, I knew there were many, many things in the Bible that I did not understand, but I did not feel that they were urgent, practical truths that a preacher needed to make known every day. But then if the Lord said, do you want to go further? It obviously seemed to the Lord that there was further to go. Now, I'm, I'm somewhat ashamed, really, of my reactions in some ways. Well, I have learned by experience not to speak hastily to God. Never say to God anything you don't mean because he'll hold you to it. So I said in so many words, Lord, give me a little time and I'll come back with my answer. And about three days later, I got back in touch with the Lord. It was on the top of a cliff in a lonely place. And I said, uh, I'm ready with my answer. And I said, no, Lord, I'm not satisfied. If there is anything further, God forgive me for saying that, but I said, if there is anything further, I want to go further. And you know, when I said I'm not satisfied, for the first time I realized how dissatisfied I really was. And with many Christians, particularly preachers, there has to come a moment of truth when you face the fact that the results you achieve are not what you would wish to achieve. Many, many preachers come to this place and then the devil will say, well, that's what everybody does. This is all there is to it. There is nothing more. There's nothing more to know. You just have to go on this way. True, it was different in the days of the apostles, but those days are past. Now, I didn't believe that, theoretically. But sometimes I acted as if the days of the apostles were past. Anyhow, I made a sincere commitment to God without having any idea of what I was committing myself to. But I said, Lord, I'm willing to go further. And from then on, the course of my life began to change under the hand of God. And it ended up totally different from what I had been anticipating. Within a year, the Lord brought me to the United States without my planning it. 
or having any intentions in that direction. I became a permanent resident of the United States and just recently I took United States citizenship. Now that was not in my plan, but it was in God's plan. And I began to realize a few months after I made this commitment that the Lord was putting me through what I call a postgraduate course of spiritual training. And I must say it was thorough. He spared no time. He spared no expense. He would take me halfway across the continent back again just to learn one lesson. There were various things in the New Testament that he opened up to me that I had never understood or been able to apply before. And one of them was this business of dealing with evil spirits. Now, as a Pentecostal preacher, I'd always believed in evil spirits. They're in the Bible. Every now and then I'd been backed up into a corner in an unpleasant situation where I'd had to recognize that what was in front of me was somebody with an evil spirit. And like most people, I used to imagine that if I shouted loud enough, something might happen. And every now and then something did happen. But it was a very isolated, unusual, and unwelcome experience, and I got away from it as quick as I could. Furthermore, because of my association with Pentecostal people, I had made an assumption, which most but not all Pentecostal believers make, that once you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, there's no possibility of having an evil spirit in you, and you cannot possibly need deliverance from an evil spirit. I've never heard anybody preach a sermon on that or prove it out of Scripture, but it was an assumption that was generally made, and I found myself making the same assumption. As a result of this, looking back on my past ministry, I can realize that people came to me whose needs I was absolutely unable to meet because I refused to recognize them. I can think of two particular cases. One was a young man who got saved in a street meeting when I was preaching, had a tremendous conversion, baptized in the Holy Spirit, became a very eager, dedicated worker for the Lord. I mean, he put most other people to shame with his zeal and his dedication. But he had one problem a very embarrassing one. It was lust in a specific form, and he never could get permanent victory over this. And he would come to my wife and me and say, pray with me. And I remember one occasion we prayed from about 10 o'clock at night till about 2 a.m. And he would say, it's leaving me. It's leaving me. Don't stop praying. I can feel it. It's in my fingers. It's going. Now, if I heard anybody say that today, I'd know immediately what to do. But in those days, this didn't make sense to me. And so though we prayed by the hour, we never got that young man delivered. And I have met him years later, he still had the same problem. A dedicated, sincere Christian worker, but there was one area in his life where he never got permanent victory. And it affected, of course, a great deal of the rest of his testimony. Then there was another man who came, a Jew from Germany. And I particularly love the Jewish people, I'm particularly delighted when a Jew finds Christ. This man found Christ and made a bold open confession, which is not easy for a Jew. Now, I knew, got to know a little of his background. Out of his entire family in Germany, only he and an elder brother survived. All the rest of the family, father, mother, uncles, cousins, aunts, every other relative perished in Hitler's gas chambers. Secondly, he was the second child and his mother had wanted a girl. And when he turned up a boy, she just wouldn't accept the fact that he was a boy until he was about 15 years old. She dressed him and treated him as if he was a girl. Now, if I met anybody with those two facts in their background today, I would immediately know even what demons to look for. But at that time, no. Now, he was saved. He was baptized in the Holy Spirit. I heard him speak in tongues, and I know German. It was not German. Beautiful, anointed other tongues. But at other times he would come to me and say, can't you get this devil out of me? And he would tell me things that this thing made him do. He would even, to punish himself, he would put his fingers in the door and slam the door on his fingers. And though it's not pleasant to speak about it, he was driven to drinking his own urine as a form of self-punishment. Now, if I met anybody that said that to me today, I would know immediately the nature of their problem. He said, drive this devil out of me. I said, you can't have a devil in you. You're baptized in the Holy Spirit. Heard you speak in tongues. And I, can, I could add many to that list. But I realized because of my particular doctrinal preconception at that point, I was not able to see, and therefore I was not able to minister to the needs of these people. Well, it was when this period of what I call postgraduate spiritual training that one of the main themes God dealt with was evil spirits 
and how to deal with them. And he brought me face to face with a fact absolutely in a way that could not be challenged by anybody that's willing to accept simple plain facts that multitudes of people baptized in the Holy Spirit still need deliverance from evil spirits. Now, I'm going to tell you just briefly one or two of the main instances that brought me face to face with this. And I'm only going to give a few instances out of many, but some that always remain vividly in my memory. In 1963-64, I was pastoring an independent Pentecostal church in a certain city in the United States. And one day, a Baptist pastor phoned me. It was a Saturday morning. Now, I, I, my ideas of Baptist pastors at, those time, at that time were somewhat different from what they are now. This man had been baptized in the Holy Spirit, and for that reason he wasn't pastoring a Baptist church. But he was a Baptist pastor, and he said, I have a lady who needs deliverance from evil spirits. Well, that was a rather unusual statement for me to hear from the lips of a Baptist pastor in the first place. Then he said, she's been baptized in the Holy Spirit. Well, that was still more surprising. And then he said, the Lord has shown me that you and your wife are to be the instruments of deliverance and it's to happen today. Well, I've never had anybody say that over, to me, over the phone to me before. And I don't let people dictate to me with their revelations. So I sent a quick wire up to the Lord while I was still on the phone. Lord, is this you? Is this all right? Am I to go along with this? And it seemed to me the Lord said, yes, this is right. Well, I said, all right, bring the lady around. So my wife and I prepared for this. In the meanwhile, a Presbyterian married couple came along who also had received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, just visiting. And I said, sit down, and stay and see what happens. Well, the Baptist pastor came in with a lady. She was, I would say, about 35 years old. I learned later that she was a mother of three children and perfectly ordinary looking American middle class housewife, you would say. This Baptist pastor got down to business very quickly. He sat the lady down in a chair, said, now she's been delivered from the demon of nicotine, but there are others there. And I sat there uh, detached and observing and deciding not to go along with it and yet not to reject it. And then he did something, but now I want to say emphatically at this point, I'm not recommending everything that was done as being a pattern of what should be done. By no means, I'm just telling you the way it was. So he sat this lady down in a chair and started to stir up the devil in her. That's exactly what he did. He commanded Satan to manifest himself. And after a while, there was a definite reaction from the lady. I was sitting there watching her and her countenance changed. It was as though another personality was beginning to appear. And a thing I've never forgotten, a kind of yellow sulfurous glare appeared in the center of each eyeball. And I knew objectively that there was something there that wasn't just a good middle-class Baptist housewife. But uh, this preacher, like many, many people, not just preachers, uh, had the idea, which I must say is incorrect, that demons will get impressed if you shout at them. And it isn't true. All you're doing is wasting a lot of strength and energy. It could be better used in other ways. And he was shouting at this, whatever it was in this woman. And uh, as I say, he got the thing to show its presence, but got no further. So I thought to myself, well, if he can do it, I can do it. And I must thank God that I had a thorough, basic knowledge of Scripture. I'm glad that I had it before I went into this. And everything that I did and everything that, I ha that happened, I checked mentally with reference to Scripture. So I knew, theoretically, that if I spoke to this thing in the name of Jesus, it would have to obey me. I knew that. Luke 10, 17, there it is. Even the demons are subject unto us through thy name. <clears throat> so I got in front of the lady. And I said to her something like this. I said, now, you evil spirit that's in this woman, I'm talking to you and not to the woman. What is your name? In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I command you to answer me. And the answer came immediately. Just one syllable, like a serpent's hiss, hate. And everything in the woman's features and attitude registered pure, undiluted hatred. I had never seen such total hatred in anybody's eyes in all my life. Well, there I was, I'd got the name, and I really didn't know what to do next. Now, I have to say, in what follows, I was motivated by one thought. Whatever the devil wants, I want something different. If he would say one thing, I would say the opposite. Now, I want to tell you that this was in the presence of about four or five reliable witnesses, all of whom would be willing to testify today to what happened. Well, I thought, what do I do now? So I said, now, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you demon of hate, or I think they said you spirit of hate, come out of her. 
And this insolent voice, which was not the least bit like the woman's voice, said this. This is my house. I've lived here 35 years and I'm not coming out. And again, I said to myself, that's right, Matthew 12, Jesus said the unclean spirit called the person in whom he had resided his house. Well, I said, you are coming out. And after that, it became a kind of psychological warfare. I had to beat this thing down stage by stage, and each stage took quite a while. And what I'm describing, and I'm going to describe it briefly, actually took five hours to transpire. So I said, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you are coming out. And it said, I'm not coming out. And I said, you are coming out. And I gradually realized the more I quoted scripture and used the name of Jesus, the more ascendancy I gained over this thing. So after a while, it began to bargain with me. And it said, well, if I come out, I'll come back. When I immediately, whatever it said, I was going to say the opposite. I said, no, you'll come out and you'll stay out. And we argued that one for a while. And then it came down one notch lower and it said, well, even if I come out, my brothers are here and they'll kill her. Well, I didn't know anything about his brothers, but I was going to argue everyone. So I said, no, you come out first and your brothers will come out after you. And I picked up the message. There's something more than one in here. Well, we argued that one. And then it said, well, even if we come out of the woman, we've got her daughter and we'll kill her. Well, I didn't know the woman had a daughter at the time, but I said, no, you come out of the woman first and you come out of her daughter afterwards. Well, after this argument, it changed its tactics. And without any warning, the woman's arms rose up, crossed over her throat, and she began to throttle herself with her own arms. And uh, this was not play. Her face was going purple and her eyes were starting to protrude out of her head. So the Presbyterian man who was taller and heavier than I am and I rose up and with our united strength, we just succeeded in pulling that woman's hands away from her throat. Her strength was totally supernatural. After this, I went at this thing again and at a, all this time in me, there was a tremendous inner, tremendous inner pressure, like an inflated balloon sort of pushing against this spirit in this woman. But at a certain moment, as something happened, there was a kind of hissing noise out of the woman's mouth, her head dropped forward limply, her body relaxed, and this pressure in me relaxed, and I knew it had gone out. But after a little while, the woman became tense again, and I realized that there were what the demon had called its brothers there. So we went through this procedure for, as I say, about five hours. And it was very tiring, so when one of us got tired, another one would step in front and more or less use the same methods. And I think in the course of the day, practically every adult present took a turn in dealing with these evil spirits. Um, the first one that named itself was hate. The next one, if I remember rightly, was fear. Then there was pride, jealousy, and self-pity. Now that was a revelation to me. Self-pity is a demon. Oh, how many things I began to understand in my own experience and other people's immediately when I grasped that fact. By this time, the woman was getting very exhausted and we had spent about four hours. When we got to self-pity, I made the next one name itself. It said infidelity. And at the time, I didn't understand that, so I put it in my pending file, but I know well now that there are demons that drive women to sexual immorality. I wasn't quite sure how to interpret that word. And let me say that a demon like infidelity does not necessarily come in because a woman has been unfaithful to her husband. It comes in to make her unfaithful to her husband or a husband to his wife. 